Now on BBC One, Sue Cook and Nick Ross present this month's edition of Crime Watch UK. We start with the aftermath of a crime that last month became a major news item. Hi. Hello, is Roxanne there, please? Yeah, um, Roxanne? Yeah. Hello, can we come in, please? Yeah, yeah certainly. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want to sit down? some very sad news. It's about your mother. Janet Brown lived in the village of Radnidge in Buckinghamshire. Her murder achieved huge publicity because, to put it bluntly, she was attractive, she was affluent, and she was found naked in her home. In fact, there's no evidence of a sexual element to the crime. It seems she may have woken to find an intruder. Her husband works in Switzerland, and of their three children, only the youngest, Roxanne, still lived at home. So they were trying to sell the house. She was a wonderful mum. She was very kind and caring, very good listener. She always understood me very well and never bossed me around. I uh, miss her so much. And she was a great friend as well as a mum. Hello. Hi, it's me. Oh, hi. How are you doing? Fine. Any more news from our house, Bart? Well, he's still keen. You know, I'm still hoping to get back at the weekend. Depends how things go here, of course. She was a super person. She was warm and friendly. She was very loyal to her family. Uh, she was. She looked after the kids very well. Um, and uh, as well as that, she was quite a determined person, quite a, a plucky person. Early morning call. Thanks. Oh, darling, mm? you know the builders are coming today. And since you're on holiday... What are they doing? They're going to fix the barn roof. Oh. So can you make sure they're OK? I shall leave a key out in case they need to get in. In the kitchen? Mm. What are you doing today? I've got a driving lesson this morning. Oh. if you pass first time. You told me you're going to fail. Do you fancy coming out? I'd love to. You can stay over if you like. OK, I'll tell my mum I won't be back tonight. Right, my driving instructor's here. See you later. Everything OK? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Janet's initial training was as a nurse and a midwife. And then, after many years off looking after the kids, she had recently returned to work. And her current project was to, to examine the possibility of there being a link between infertility treatment and the ultimate development of cancer in women. No one remembers Janet leaving work that day, but she'd normally have gone home at roughly half past five. I'd been out riding for about an hour and was heading home on Spriggs Holly Lane when I noticed Janet heading towards me, heading away from her house and towards Radnich. She appeared to be preoccupied with something. Normally she'd slow down as I was on a horse, but on this occasion she didn't. I don't remember that she was in her own car. Can I use your phone? I just want to give Mum a quick ring at home. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I think I'm going to go to bed early. What time are you coming back tomorrow? Um, lunchtime, probably. Oh, OK. I'll leave the alarm on. OK. See you. Bye. Bye. We know Janet also took a call from one of Roxanne's friends. That was at ten past eight. 
It was the last we know of anyone who talked to her. Can I have a um, fillet of beef, please? Yeah. Can I have the charcoal salmon with aubergines and peppers? Yeah. And uh, I'll have the roast saddle of lamb, please. Thank you. Here's to you passing your driving test. And then I'll have to carry you around everywhere. <laughs> I'm trying my best. <laughs> and then he came over and he said, Can I go out with you? Oh, oh my God, God, really? Really? <laughs> I was driving along Spriggs Holly Lane towards Radnich and just past the Browns house on my left in an area locally known as the Triangle. I saw a car parked quite a way back off of the road. We take note of this sort of thing because of the burglars that have been around here in the past and it makes us suspicious if we see cars parked at this time of night. I've put the extra in because I had a dessert. No, don't be silly. No, honestly. No, I'll split the bill. Split the bill. Yeah. Yeah. very sad news we went to your house earlier today and we found a person there who was dead we believe that person to be your mother Michael Short with so little to go on I suppose it's a bit naive to suggest that maybe someone went home with a lot of blood on them that night I don't think so for without going into details we know that the person who carried out this act must have been heavily bloodstained and so I would appeal to anybody, friend, relative, who knows anything, to, to come forward. In addition, such a brutal murder as that, somebody must have spoken, the person who did it must have confided in somebody. So I really would ask anybody to come forward to stop it happening again. In addition, there is a £10,000 reward. We're talking about Monday the 10th of April, which is the week leading up to Easter, and somebody that evening would have gone home with really a lot of blood. A lot, no doubt at all about that, a lot of blood. Now, the only other things that you might have as, as clues, we've got some things here which come from them. That taping of the window, which is a very peculiar thing to do, which was using this sellotape or weather tape, which is a sort of rather unusual thing, to, not only to do, but substance to use. That's right. It's not common. It's not the normal sellotape. It's used just to repair greenhouses and cloches. Um, sellotape have only supplied 1,300 in this year to local area, local area. So it, it is unusual, and if you couple that with the other items... And the other items are that this was used to, to restrain her as well. This is just all the masking tape, and obviously right. people can buy that all over the place. These uh, handcuffs, which were used to restrain her as well, again, I mean, these presumably can... Uh, fairly common, these things. Yeah, they're, they're ever so common, and we certainly wouldn't be able to trace where they came from, but and again, you've got to add to that the glass cutter the we instrument that was used to, to break the window. All most unusual things. If you put them together, it could well mean something to somebody. So what you want is somebody who maybe sold somebody a whole variety of these things together, somebody who can put together a picture, a, a jigsaw puzzle, a as it were. Absolutely, or anybody seen people with it. Now, Janet Brown was going in her car, it seems, that evening, away from home at half past six. Now, what do you know about that? We know nothing. It's certainly she was going away from where she normally shopped and where she normally got petrol. So we would really like anybody to come forward who, who she went to, to meet, to visit. In addition, we still know very little about Janet. We'd like anybody that 
a friend of hers, has seen her in restaurants, seen her anywhere in the weeks leading up to her death to come forward. OK, well, if there's any way that you can help, if you can eliminate that car scene in the local triangle, do please call. Detective Superintendent Michael Short and his team are waiting for your call, either here in the studio, 0500 600 600, or you can reach their colleagues in the incident room. That's on 01 296 396 333. 01 296, the code for Aylesbury, 396 333. Well, looking at the results from last month's programme, police seem pleased with the calls that came through on most of the cases. In particular, detectives investigating the murder of Julie Finlay in Liverpool received some fascinating information on drug dealers in the area, and the inquiry has now moved several steps further. We can't say any more, I'm afraid, about that at the moment. Likewise, delicate information has come in from viewers on the Security Express robberies. Come on, move over. Come on, move. Your mate's coming in as well. Well, I hope we can say more on both those cases in next month's programme. Last month's photocall appeals produced results too, and we'll give you details on that later. But now here are Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames with the first of this month's appeals. Have you seen this man? He's Peter Frederick Payne, and he's wanted for serious sexual offences against a young person. In June last year, he broke bail during his trial at Liverpool Crown Court. The hearing continued, and he was found guilty of 12 offences. Peter Payne is 49, six foot with brown hair and tattoos on both forearms. He wears tinted glasses and may be working as a driver. He was recently seen in the Wirral area of Merseyside and he may visit Essex. If you know where he is, please call us now. Colleagues in Surrey are anxious to speak to this man. On February the 23rd, a stolen credit card was used to withdraw thousands of pounds. Here he is at the Lloyds Bank in Ewell. Later that day, he was in Lloyds Bank in North Cheam. Take another look at him. He's in his early 30s, 5 foot 10 to 6 foot, and of stocky build. He has a distinctive boxer-style nose and a Midlands accent. If you know who or where he is, please call. Perhaps you know this woman. She's Angela Dodge, and 14 police forces are keen to speak to her. Worthless cheques have been used for the last three years to purchase cars and travellers' cheques. In Western Supermare and North Wales, hotel accommodation worth hundreds of pounds was not paid for, and in July 1993, a £30,000 fraud was discovered in Swindford, Ireland. Take another look at Angela Dodge. She's 52, about 5 foot 5, and of medium build. She was last seen a month ago in Devon and may now be driving a white Ford Sierra, registration number C329DDV. If you know where she is, call us tonight. In February, this man robbed the Alliance and Leicester in Slough, Berkshire. We see him as he tells the staff not to follow him and calmly walks out. He's about 30, slim, about 5 foot 6, with short, dark brown, neat hair. He may be responsible for attempting to rob the same building society two weeks later. If you recognise him, or if you can help with any of our photocall cases, call us now. There's a number for a Anyone you think you've seen there, 0500 600 600. Remember, it's free call, 0500 600 600. It's just over a month now since a couple who own a jewellery shop in London's Hatton Garden were ruthlessly targeted by a team of at least three men. Two stolen vehicles were used and the attack took place in broad daylight. Flying squad detectives are convinced there are people who will have witnessed something, almost certainly not realising the importance of what they were seeing. The date is Tuesday the 18th of last month. For most people, it was the first day back to work after the Easter break. Maureen. Yeah? I'm off now. OK, I'll be in around 10.30. Fine. I'll see you then. See ya. My husband and I have got a retail jeweller shop in Hatton Garden. We've been there for 20 years. He left home about 8.20, 8.30 to open up. I was going to follow in later. Hello. Hello, Dad. You all right? Yeah, as well as we expected. Good. Maureen in yet? No, she'll be here in about half an hour. My father comes to visit me in the shop every day. He's retired now. And he helps out in the mornings or he goes to get breakfast for us. I'll pop across the road and get a couple, shall I? Shortly after 10 o'clock, a couple remember seeing a man getting out of a white Vauxhall Astra in Hatton Garden. 
He was in his late 20s, early 30s, about six feet tall, some build, wearing a shirt and tie. I left the house at approximately 10 past 10, and I was walking in Farringdon Road at around about 10.30 when I turned into St Cross Street. They were definite London accents, very, very hyped up, shouting at me. My first thoughts was, I've got to stay calm here, otherwise I'm not going to get out of this. Well, I still fancy the second favourite. Yeah? What race is that? At 2.30. Oh. Hello? Is that David? Yeah. Hang on, I've got Maureen for you. They've got me in a white van. What's going on? What's happened? We've got Maureen. Just do as you're told and she won't get hurt. Are you listening? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm listening. There's a white Astra parked over St Cross Street. Go to it and get the holders out the back seat. Come back to the shop and fill in with jewellery and money and take them back to the car. Well, what kind of stuff do you want? Everything. Just get it out to the car. You've got ten minutes. Where's the car? Over St Cross Street. Just do as you're told if you want to see her again. But I'm all right. Just do what they say. Maureen? Ma now, what's up, son? Uh, nothing. Can you hang on here a minute? I, 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 I won't be long. Right. When the van drove off, I didn't know where I was going. We didn't seem to be going in any one straight direction. We seemed to be doing lots of turns. I walked down some cross street over a couple of turnings, looking for this white Astra and I couldn't find it. The instructions weren't clear on where it was. And as I got back to the top of St Cross Street and the crossroads of Hatton Garden, I looked to the right and it was parked two in. Look, what's up? There's some kind of trouble in there. Yes. They've kidnapped Maureen, mm. but everything's going to be OK. Now, listen, there's a white Astra parked just beyond St Cross Street, OK? Mm. Go down there and keep an eye on it right, for me, I'll all right? I'll do that. Yeah, oh, and take down the registration number. Of course. A few moments after the van stopped, Maureen heard the men talking outside. Passers-by must have seen them. Then just one of the men got back in the van and started off again. When I saw my son coming towards me, I, there was nothing I could do. I had to uh, make out I didn't recognise him, I didn't know him. Meanwhile, Maureen was driven only a short distance to St John Street. When I saw the man go into the car, I felt so terribly frustrated because I knew I was not allowed to, to go after him. Terrible feeling. Nothing I could do about it. As soon as he thought it was safe, David called the police. Just a couple of minutes ago, they said if I did everything they asked, she'd be all There's right. Some bloke just driven off on the White Astra down towards Clarkenwell Road. Yeah, yeah. There's a number. Hang on a second, I've got the registration number. It's B223RGC. GC. Uh, yes, RGC. Yeah. They're just driven off down Clarkenwell Road. Yeah. Don't move. I'm going to stand just outside the van. I laid there for a few minutes because I was very disorientated and I started to listen and I looked out and could see no one and I thought I must be fairly safe to get out.
when I got outside, it, it was a great relief. I didn't care where I was, but I knew that I was OK. I was free. Well, Barry Phillips, there were at least three men involved in the robbery. You have a good description of one of them. Yes, the driver of the Astra was a white male, about six foot tall, late 20s, early 30s, thin build, wearing gold rimmed glasses, and is in fact similar to the description of the man who drove the Astra off after the drop had been made. Right. And that car and the van have both been stolen? They have. They've both been stolen in February in the South London area and have obviously been laid up for some quite considerable time. Quite a few weeks. So you might have seen uh, those vehicles during that time. And the Astra's original um, registration number was E321VKR. But you may have noticed the false plates because someone obviously made a mistake when making them up. The front plate read B223RGC and the back was B223RCG. So you might have noticed that. When was the transit stolen exactly? The transit was stolen on the 27th of February, so again it was laid up for six weeks. Was it laid up with the, the, the right index number shown, which was F588FKK, or when it had been dollied up with the false index plates, which is E875HLM? Someone may have seen them together. The car and the van certainly were both in the um, Hatton Garden area for quite a while on the morning of the robbery. That is correct, and we're looking for people who, who must have seen what went on, particularly the abduction and the van in St. Cross, uh, St John Street when the driver either walked away from it or was he picked up by uh, uh, the others in a, another vehicle. And just to remind you, it was the day after the bank holiday, Tuesday the 18th of April. Somebody, a useful witness, somebody saw a man taking photos nearby that morning. Yes, we do know that a man was parked in a car quite early in Hatton Garden and at about 10 o'clock he got out and took photographs of a building we see here on the corner of Hatton Garden and St Cross Street. Uh, we would particularly like him to come forward as he must have seen some of what went on that morning. Without realising it, so yes, yeah. you need him to come forward. And if you can find some of the jewellery, of course, you'll be making progress. Yes, the jewellery stolen from the uh, venue is quite distinctive. The hallmark we see is particularly um, identifiable to the premises. And we'd also like to hear from anyone who's offered any of the other items of jewellery that we see here. Yeah, they're all quite distinctive and valuable. They, yes. In fact, there's a £40,000 reward for, on offer in this case, which I think is the largest reward that uh, I've, had, I've known since I presented this programme. If you saw anything, if particularly if you saw the car or the van during the two months leading up to this attack, please ring us either on our studio number here on 0500 600 600 or the Flying Squad Direct, and that number is 0181 733 5751. That's 0181 733 5751. Let me bring you up to date with some of the calls we've been getting in. And I've just seen that on the Janet Brown murder, uh, we've got some quite good information about somebody who was in one of the cars seen in the area. Now, I can't say anything more about it, not because I'm withholding any information from you, because I just don't know more at the moment. On photo call on Peter Frederick Payne, a few sightings clustering around uh, the same region of the country. In fact, I've seen four. It's pretty much put him in the same place. On the sorry credit card fraud, that too looks very promising. Fifteen names saying he comes from, again, the same area of the country. Let's uh, widen the net now. Some more appeals from Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames. Tonight we have new information about the abduction of a five-year-old girl from Blakelaw in Newcastle two weeks ago. She was indecently assaulted and abandoned 40 miles away in Darlington. It was shortly after 8.30 p.m. on Thursday the 4th of May when the victim was approached by a man near the Moulton Place shopping centre. He pushed her into a white car. An hour earlier, witness saw this man in nearby Cragstone Avenue. He may have vital information. He was in his 30s of medium build with dark hair and a moustache, a round face and wore a light blue shirt. He was sitting in a white saloon type car, possibly a registration which had scratches on the driver's door. If you can help, please call the incident room in Gosforth on 0191 232 3451. That's 0191, the code for Newcastle, 232 3451. Our next case takes place early in the morning of Wednesday the 8th of February in one of Manchester's most exclusive shopping streets, King Street. At that time in the morning, the street has either office people on it or boutique people, and their dress tells you that. This person didn't fit into any of those categories. He just looked shifty. He looked shady. As I walked out of St Anne's Passage, I turned, and there he was, right in front of me again. He was between five foot nine and six foot. I'd say between 25 and 35. Very heavily built, very dark-skinned, more African than Caribbean. 
in his features. He appeared to be going around in circles. I think we'll change that display today. What are you thinking of? Maybe the new diamond ring. Yeah, that's fine. got dropped off. It was about nine o'clock and I saw this red Sierra Sapphire and it was more or less blocking the passage and just thought it was a bit of a stupid place to park. Sierra was abandoned around the corner in Back Bridge Street. Perhaps you saw where the robbers went next. Three weeks later, on Saturday the 4th of March, this man entered a jeweller's in Manchester city centre. Here he is attempting to sell a string of pearls which could have come from the robbery at Hancock's Jewellers. If you recognise him and can help eliminate him from the inquiry, please call tonight. There's a substantial reward on offer for information on this case. A number of rings were stolen in the robbery, which are all engraved on the inside and bear the Hancock's hallmark. So, if you've been offered any of the jewellery, or recognise either the man with the knife or the man seen on the security video, we'd like to hear from you. The incident room number in Manchester is 0161 856 3259. That's 0161, the code for Manchester, 856 3259. And finally, we need your help to trace this man who raped a woman in North Durham. At around 4am on Tuesday, the 14th of February, he broke into her home in Chesterless Street, threatened her with a screwdriver and assaulted her. He's in his 30s, around 5 foot 7, with dark brown hair and a slim build. He wore a light-coloured woolen hat and spoke with a local accent. If you recognise him or can help in any way, please call the Chesterless Street Police now on 0191 388 4311. That's 0191, the code for Durham, 388 4311. And here's our number. The call is free. Many of the lines are free at the moment, too. 0500 600 600. 0500 600 600. Back in November, we appealed for help to find nine-year-old Daniel Handley from Beckton in East London. He disappeared on Sunday, October the 2nd. But as the weeks turned into months, hopes of finding Daniel alive began to dwindle. And finally, on March the 27th, the investigation became a full-scale murder inquiry when a child's body was discovered near Bristol. So now, once again, we're appealing for your help. Detective Superintendent Ed Williams here is running the inquiry, and with his help, our film pieces together now as much as is known about Daniel's disappearance so far. OK, then, I'll see you tomorrow, then. Bye. Soon after Daniel's mother reported his disappearance on the 2nd of October, we organised what is perhaps the biggest police search ever in London for a missing child. Daniel was riding a very, very distinctive bike at the time he disappeared. As you can see, it doesn't have a saddle. The frame of the bike was silver. On March the 27th, Daniel's remains were discovered on an isolated piece of land off Trench Lane near the Bradley Stoke estate on the outskirts of Bristol. We believe that Daniel was abducted by paedophiles. Maybe Daniel stopped off on the journey from London to Bristol on the motorway. Perhaps he was even kept here on the Bradley Stoke North Estate in a house on the estate. Discovery of a boy's body in Trench Lane. I wanted to ask you some questions. Yeah, certainly. It could be that Daniel was kept in Wales. One thing we are certain of is that Daniel's burial site was no accident. We believe that whoever left Daniel here knew this area. Very important come in. That we exactly. One of the things to come out of our investigation after the crime watch reconstruction was filmed was that at 6.30 p.m. on Sunday the 2nd of October, a passing motorist saw a silver or grey car and we're not certain of the make or model. A passenger from that car was actually talking to a boy that we believe was Daniel. There was a second man in the driver's seat. 
the motorist was concerned enough to turn and drive back. He saw the car pull across to the other side of Tollgate Road. These men have not come forward. It is vital that we find out who they are and anyone else who may have seen them. A short alleyway connects Tollgate Road with Wintergreen Close, which is where a short time later, Daniel's bike was found abandoned. Well, Ed, now that Daniel's body has been discovered in the Bristol area, that's opened up a whole new area of information there, hasn't it? It has indeed. And although I'm not in a position to release too much information at this stage for strategic reasons, it is correct to say that there have been a number of sightings of a child that we firmly believe to be Daniel. On the first occasion that Daniel was seen in the company of men, he looked fairly comfortable. But unfortunately, on the second occasion, he looked quite distressed. He appeared to be hoist between two men held by the wrists and was virtually a prisoner, we believe. And you are convinced that was Daniel, he was wearing the red tracksuit? We've got good cause to believe that we have reliable evidence that this was Daniel. How long do you think he was alive after being taken to Bristol? There's every possibility that he was alive for at least 10 to 12 days after being taken from London to Bristol. And you mentioned there a Wales connection. Do you think he might have been taken to Wales during that time? It's a possibility. He could have been taken over the Severn Bridge. He could have been kept in a holiday home, a caravan or a chalet, either in Wales or in the, the southwest somewhere. And I believe that if anybody has information uh, about a child recently taken, or after the 2nd of October, taken into a holiday community, I'd like them to contact us. Mm. And you're desperate to find the silver or grey saloon car and the people in it. Yes, I am. On the 2nd of October, 1994, when that car was parked in Tollgate Road, there were two men in that car. One of those men was on the pavement actually talking to Daniel. Now, neither of those men has come forward, and neither has the couple that were allegedly walking past at the time. I'm still anxious to trace those men, that couple, and that car, mm. which by now may well have been destroyed, abandoned, or indeed even stored somewhere. I'm anxious to hear from any member of the public who after the 2nd of October 1994, in London or in Bristol, knows of a silver or gray car that comes into the category of being a Lada, a Nissan, or a Skoda that has been abandoned or burnt out or anything of that kind. If it's suspicious, let us know. Edward, thank you very much. If you have seen anything, if anything you've just seen in the film has jogged your memory or awakened your suspicions in any way, if you saw that grey or silver saloon car and the two men near the Tollgate Road, please do call. You can ring the studio here tonight on 0500 600 600 or ring the incident room and that's 0181 503 1212. That's 0181 503 1212. I'm the man you're looking for, said one man after last month's crime watch when police came to arrest him, and he's now in custody awaiting trial. But I'm not the man you're after, said another. His night away with his girlfriend has been rather rudely interrupted because he gave the hotel an unfortunate false name, that of someone wanted in a murder case. The hotelier remembered the case on crime watch and summoned the police. In fact, the real suspect was later arrested 200 miles away. One arrest last month was not as a result of the programme, but this man, whose photo was taken by a tourist, was identified by well over a dozen viewers. He's Michael John Smith. If you've seen him, or Michael, if you're watching, please call and help clear up some complaints about deception. Over 43 callers recognise this man, but now he's changed his appearance, we believe. If you know where he is, please call us. Here now are Superintendent David Hatcher and uh, Constable Jackie Hames with more Faces to Find. Do you know this man, Fitzroy Donald Willis? Colleagues in South London would like to speak to him in connection with the murder of 26-year-old Shirley White in Clapham on Friday the 10th of March. Willis, also known as Junior, is 33, 5 foot 10 with a distinctive scar running along his jaw. He's known to travel between the London and Birmingham areas. If you know where he is, please call us now. This is Anthony Norman Walker, and officers in Cheshire, Merseyside and Lancashire would like to speak to him. Between October 1994 and March 1995, at least 50 elderly people have been conned, and many have lost their life savings. Anthony Walker is 25, 5 foot 5 and slim. He has a tan complexion, and he may no longer have a moustache. He was last seen two months ago in Crosby, Merseyside. If you know where he is now, call us tonight. Have you seen this woman? She's Susan Munnock, and police in Southampton would like to speak to her. At around 2 a.m. on the 14th of February, an argument broke out at the kebab takeaway shop in Bedford Place. Shortly afterwards, a man was stabbed as he walked away. 
take another look at Susan Munnock. She's 31, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 8 and well built. If you know where she is, call us tonight. And finally, do you recognise these three men? Guildford police are very keen to talk to them. During November and December last year, large amounts of cash were obtained by using stolen visa cards presented at banks in Surrey. Take a closer look at the men. They're all stocky and in their early 40s. Man one is five foot eight with short, light brown hair. Man number two is five foot nine with very short, fair hair and wearing glasses. And the third is taller, six foot, with short, dark hair and he had a moustache. Call us if you recognise them or if you think you know the whereabouts of any of our photo call faces. And once again, the number here is 0500 600 600. That's free call number 0500 600 600. Next, a tragedy, an accident almost, but the sort of thing that makes people despair. Two children stealing from an old woman in the street. The woman, Mrs. Christina Gray, happened to have osteoporosis or brittle bone disease. 7 in 2, 77. 5 in 8, 15. 7 in 3, 73. 6 in 3, 63. 7 in 4, 74. 7 in 8, 78. All 5, 55. Oh, yeah. I thought that was going to be my lucky turn then. <laughs> How about you, Hit? Another three pounds down the drain. Oh. Never mind. Come on, let's go and have a coffee, Chris. Bingo was her main hobby. You know, it's a way of socialising. She enjoyed life. She, she made the best out of what she had. The osteoporosis, when it hit her, she was bedridden. But, I mean, that would last a week and then she'd be back out, up to bingo, and feeding her cats. You know, cats were her main thing. She really had a will about her, and a will to live. She was an amazing woman in the respect that there she is heading off up that, that hill, which I try and avoid at the best of times myself. Even if it was just to get her newspaper, she'd, if that's what she had to get, she'd go. These boys were crossing the road in front of me and they were lurking around. They looked like two little boys up to mischief. They say I have a beady eye. And they, when they saw me, they hurried out. And I couldn't see much of them because they had scarves and hats. And I just saw two little boys up to mischief. Not evil. Security video shows Mrs. Gray and her friend left the club at 3.55. You going shopping now? No, I've been already. I'm off home. Oh, I'll walk along with you oh, then. Thanks, that's nice. Take care then, won't you? Thank you, Hicks. A witness saw two women walking up Lansdowne Place. One was Mrs. Gray. The other is crucial to the inquiry because of something she might have seen. Do you know who she is or where she was going? When I first turned into the road, um, it was nothing out of the ordinary. It's just as you get further down the road. 
that I noticed there was something in the road there. I thought, what on earth's that? been attacked. Two black boys, they swung me round and threw me down, then, then they ran off up there, up, up Fox Hill. I think I've done something to my leg. Oh, I, I just want to get home. It, it's just down the road. Mrs Gray's hip was broken and so was her arm. Five hours later, she died in hospital of her injuries and shock. Prime Burden Brown, the best we can say is they couldn't have meant to kill her. Well, except that they possibly didn't mean to kill her, but nevertheless, this was a, a terribly cowardly attack on a frail, defenceless old lady. Uh, having said that, I do believe that uh, the lads responsible would have got a shock when they realised that they had in actual fact murdered Mrs Gray. And I also believe that because of that, they, they will have spoken to somebody about what they actually did. And I would appeal, because there is a reward on offer, for anybody with information as to the identity of these kids to get in touch straight away. Well, if you can help, 0500 600 600, remember, call us here straight away. The kids were, I mean, there were only kids, probably 12, 14, we're not sure, sure, of, sure of their age. There was another witness, though, that you're very keen to see. We, we saw her briefly in the film. Uh, she's quite petite, right. five foot, who was walking up Lansdowne Place at the same Lansdowne Place at the same time. That's right. She was a few yards behind the victim, and I'm quite sure that she must have seen either the attack or, at the very least, uh, the lads run off after attacking Mrs. Gray. This is Saturday, the 18th of March, and there are some other people that you want to try and trace again as witnesses. Right. Two young men seen in the area. Tell us about them. Well, they were seen on the morning of the attack on several occasions. We have an efit of the elder one of the two. He's described as black, aged about 20, five foot ten. He was scruffily dressed with unkempt afro hair, and his companion was aged a bit younger, 16, 17, about five foot seven. We need to, to trace these people and to eliminate them if they can't help us with the inquiry. OK, they could be brothers, I gather, from, from the description, but your they concern is that almost certainly they've seen something, even if they don't recognise its significance themselves. That's correct. OK. Please call us if there's any way you can help, and particularly if you think you know who these two main suspects are, the, the kids themselves, or if they've talked to you. 0500 600 600. Remember, it's a free call. And the detectives are here, but you can speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer, or call the Addington Police Station in South London direct. That's on 0181 649 1414. 0181 649 1414. Well, we've been very busy on the phones this afternoon, I can tell you, this evening. Um, we've got good calls on all our filter call cases, particularly on the Surrey credit card fraud. And probably the best result I can tell you so far is that two people have called offering names for whoever murdered Janet Brown in Radnage. Those, of course, being checked out, but one of those names, I can tell you, is already in the police system. So they're quite excited about that. So with any like that, we'll have come to something. If you can help with any of our cases tonight, you can still ring the studio number here. We're going to keep the lines open until midnight, as you and after that you can still help by calling the individual incident rooms direct or simply by calling your local police. We don't have to stand by and let crimes like this go by default. The Crime Watch update is at 11.20 tonight and we can tell you the news so far then. If you're not staying up that late, we'll see you next month for the last Crime Watch before the summer break. Don't have nightmares, sleep well. Good night. Good night. From the outside, she's on trial for killing her baby. They just have no compassion. 
or anything from what I've been through and and that I'm far away from home. From the outside, they were just that day's victims. It's the fact that it happened here. This is it, isn't it? This is where I died. From the outside, it's just another tabloid headline. He just said that um, what he was doing to me was better than what was on the phone. Here's stories from the inside, starting next Thursday on BBC One.